uh, friends, um, uh, I'm very happy this evening, uh, and Chris, probably morning for you, um, to uh, welcome everyone for this uh, very critical and very important uh, aspect of uh, the environment and its sustainability that is we are talking about and referring to the pollinator and the pollinator parks. So this evening is uh, dedicated to that. And we have with us the park ranger, Chris Stein with, from, from Illinois. Uh, and uh, he has practically devoted his life, a uh, large part of his life to the, uh, the little uh, uh, beauties which uh, enhance the environment and provide tons of ecological service. So we uh, eagerly await to hear from you, sir. Um, we know you have worked on the monarch and its uh, migration patterns and, and the urban parks, which help in, in those. And we wouldn't like to waste much time about your official thing. We, rather, we would like to hear from you as to what you have done and what we can do, learn from you and what we can do here. So friends, let us, you know, any questions that you have, put it up in the chat box. So at the end of the, his talk, we can choose from the Q&A and we can ask, uh, make good use of Chris's time. So Chris, oh. I think Mina, Mina, you'll have to make Chris the uh, host also so that he can do his presentation. And welcome aboard, Chris, from all of us here at SRAC South Asia. Thank you very much. It is, it is so wonderful to uh, join you. Uh, this evening. I've been looking forward to this uh, ever since Mina invited me to speak to your group. Thank you very Mina. Thank you very much, Mina. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we are, um, it is 8.30 in the morning here in Minnesota, which is a state in the United States, in the central part of the United States where I'm speaking to you from today. So we're half a world away from each other, but um, so delighted to be here. Today, I'm going to speak to you about a seventh area of focus project, uh, environmental project called Operation Pollination. And this is a project that the North American Central Chapter of SRAG has adopted, and we are now promoting it to Rotary clubs around the United States. And we have actually begun to promote it to Rotary clubs around the world. So um, this is the first time I'm speaking to uh, a, an Asian group. Um, and I'm delighted to come to South Asia today. Just to help me though, before we get into this, uh, I know that India is well represented on this uh, Present during this presentation. Are there any other countries that are on this presentation? Just speak up, please. Okay, so I, I did do a little research and saw where your the countries your SRAG chapter covers. Uh, so I you'll see during the presentation, I threw in a, a couple of slides from those different countries. Uh, but you know so much more what's going on there than I do. Uh, I just did a simple search and you'll see that soon. So as a park ranger, and I have worked 40 years, 43 years actually, as a, nas as a national park ranger, it's been a very uh, interesting career. And uh, as was mentioned during the, the latter part of my career now, I, I finally realized that the most important place to protect uh, is not necessarily the, the great national parks that I have worked at, in the United States, but your own place, your own community, because that is so essential for the health of pollinators. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So there is an operation pollination recruitment team. Again, our purpose is to recruit clubs uh, like you belong to, to uh, join the operation pollination framework, I'm gonna call it a framework because it's not really a project. It doesn't tell you what to do. It's just a simple framework. And these are the other Rotarians who I work with on this project. They're all past district governors. And um, I just want you to know that we're a small team. Uh, and, and if any of you on today's call would like to be part of this team as well, 
please just let me know to help rec- your function, of course, would be to help recruit clubs in South Asia. So very quickly, I began my rotary career uh, when I was a park ranger at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee and North Carolina. That's in the southeastern part of the United States. Then I transferred to Yosemite National Park in California, which is in the west coast of the United States. And in 2005, I uh, became the president of the Yosemite Valley Rotary Club. That was, that was Rotary's centennial year, by the way, 2005. It was 100 years since Paul Harris out of Chicago had founded Rotary. So today I'm a member of the Paths to Pollinators Rotary Network, which is in another state of the United States, in the central part of the United States, in Iowa. And I'm also a member of SRAG, like you. And, and my chapter, you know, there are 12 SRAG chapters around the globe. And my chapter is the North American Central Chapter. And Mina, uh, just so you know, I would love to present to each of the chapters. Uh, I have spoken to the Great Britain, Ireland chapter. Uh, you are the second uh, SRAG chapter that I'm speaking to. And uh, if there's any way that you can help me figure out how to speak to the other chapters, if you think what I'm saying today is interesting or will be of interest to those chapters, please let me know. And also, I need to tell you, uh, just because I'm beaming into you for, you know, uh, half an hour or an hour this morning, whatever it will turn out to be, it doesn't mean our relationship has to end after that. Uh, You know, I am here to help pollinators and make the world a better place, just like you are. So you know, as Rotarians, that that there are lots of S, there are lots of Rotary action groups, uh, and we are very fortunate to be part of the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. And from what I can tell, we are certainly one of the most active Rotary Action Groups, and it's a real honor to be part of that group. So as we enter the program now, please think about these beautiful words: the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes but in having new eyes. And that's what this Operation Pollination Project is all about, having new eyes. But with those new eyes, when we walk into a supermarket, we don't want to see this. Uh, You're a very educated group. You know that pollinators are responsible for much of the food we eat. Uh, The statistics I've seen range from 12 to 35%. So I'm not gonna throw in a statistic there but it's, it's a significant amount of the food we eat, uh, pollinators uh, make happen. Uh, you know they provide these free ecosystem services. Uh, pollinators are responsible for more than 85% of the world's plants. That, that's the world's plants, not just agricultural crops. But since the 1970s, pollinators have declined by more than 40%. In a mere 50 years, Pollinators, which are so essential to life on Earth, have declined by 40%. This is truly a global environmental crisis. And I would dare say that it it is a hidden global environmental crisis. Um, (laughs) A lot of people aren't going to know it until it it, uh, really hits us hard and there are, are no pollinators left. So as Rotarians, I know that you like to do at least three things. You like to eat, you like to do good good for the community, community projects. And I'm also gonna say you like to take quizzes. Maybe, maybe not, but I'm gonna say that it's something that you like to do. So I have one quiz for you today and forgive me that it is North American centric. But it is, again, I speak to a lot of Rotary groups in the United States, so I have a lot of slides for the United States audience. But I thought that would be good for you to see as well. So the answer to this quiz that I'm going to give you is in this photo, um, or part of the answer is in this photo. So here's the quiz. What is this? And where is it? And I'm gonna go back to that globe photo. What is this and where is it? California. 
California. Good, good, quite good answer. And why did you say California? Because we can see a lot of burnt uh, fir trees and uh, we have no, no, California has been suffering from wildfires quite a bit now. Yes, yes. Well, well, interestingly, what looks like, well, well, some, by the way, a lot of groups I speak to don't even realize that this is an aerial view of a forest, just so you know. Um, so yes, it is, number one, you did correctly identify it as an aerial view of a forest. Um, it is in North America, uh, but it's in Mexico. It's at the 10,500 foot level in these mountains just to the west of Mexico City. And these are Oyamel fir trees. And that orange on the trees or the brown, the burnt orange color is not forest fire. It's this, monarch butterflies. Millions and millions of monarch butterflies. Can you believe that? This is right now there's monarch butterflies flying south through Minnesota where I'm where I'm from and this is where they're headed. They're headed to this mountaintop in Michoacan state in uh, central Mexico to spend the winter. The in North America we have one of the greatest insect migrations in the world and that's the migration of the monarch butterfly. Uh, on the bottom of the screen, you can see that little gray circle. Those are those mountaintops in Mexico. It's just to the west of Mexico City. Uh, that's where these monarchs are headed. And then in the springtime, they start to migrate north. They hit the state of Texas, which is in the southern part of the United States. Um, and they have their, they look for milkweed. They need milkweed. To, to lay their eggs on. They will not lay their eggs on any other plant except milkweed. And they, they want that milkweed because it has a, a toxin in it. And the, the, when the egg hatches and the caterpillar comes out, uh, the larva eats that, the milkweed, it incorporates the toxins into its body. And then when it, when it becomes a monarch, a uh, butterfly, the, the adult includes those toxins in its body and it's bright orange to basically say, don't eat me. So here they are clumped on the trees in Mexico. Uh, it's, I have not seen it in person, but like my desire to come to India, I also desire to go to this place in Mexico to, uh, to see this because I under, I've spoken to many people who have seen it in person and they say it's, an incredible, you'll never believe it. But, but while this photo makes it look like there are millions and millions of monarchs, and there are, there still are, and there's two populations, by the way, there's a Western population in the Western part of the United States, which is in dire trouble, only 2000 left, the recent count. And then there's an Eastern population, which still has millions and millions, but the US Fish and Wildlife Service just considered listing the monarch migration as endangered. Um, it did not list it and it's gonna study it some more. But the monarch has declined by more than 90% since the 1990s. 90% since the 1990s. Again, there's still millions of them, but it is in, is in dire straits. So I only mentioned the monarch to the U.S. audience because the monarch is such an iconic species that we have. And so everybody knows it so they can relate to it. But certainly the monarch is not the only pollinator. You know, bees, wasps, flies, just like in India and other countries of South Asia, wasps, flies, beetles, other butterflies, moths, all are pollinators. This should look very familiar to you. Uh, this is your striped tiger, which Mina taught me about when I first spoke to her. So I did a little research on it and it looks very much like the monarch butterfly, as you can see. Um, they're in the same genus. Um, I've actually tried to stump other rangers by showing them the striped tiger and asking them, what is it? 
and I'm hoping that they say, oh, it's a monarch butterfly. And I'm like, uh, 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 that's a striped tiger. Uh, and that is from South Asia. So I did a little research, as I mentioned earlier, and to see what was going on in, in the countries of South Asia regarding pollinators. Uh, it was a simple, simple search. Uh, but there is actually an Indian pollinator initiative and they've started these monsoon student talks. Look at the date on there, it just began July 24th, 2021. Uh, in December of 2020, uh, India's first pollinator park, kind of like, a, I guess it's like a butterfly house, Mina, is that correct? You're on mute. No, they don't have a structure, it's an open uh, this thing. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and, and this is good. Peter it's, it's, is, uh, Peter Smitasik is one of the experts in butterflies in India. Okay, okay. So, you know, I, I think one of the greatest values of something like this is its educational value. Um, you know, it's going to be good for, the habitat will be good for pollinators undoubtedly. But, you know, just for the educational value alone, that's important. And really that habitat restoration and education is what the project Operation Pollination that I'm gonna get into here in a minute is all about. I also uh, searched around and saw that some of your national parks in India are now promoting the little things that run the world in addition to their large mammals. Uh, everybody likes the Indian rhino and the elephant and the tiger and the and the various deer and, and such, and the leopards and all that. But here, uh, this national park is actually promoting its pollinators. I found in Nepal that there's actually a pollinator network um, to help people bring back pollinators. In Bhutan, I uh, didn't find much, but in uh, 2018, I saw that the university there actually had a two day pollinator workshop. I mean, these are, these are minimal things, but I just wanted to, to show you that there are, uh, there are things happening. In the Maldives, I, I did not find any pollinator plans or pollinator activities. I just found a few pictures of pollinators, not the whale shark, of course, but um, I just include the, the whale shark because of the island nature of the Maldives. And in Sri Lanka, who I know is not part of SRAG, right, SRAG South Asia right now, they did have a pollinator plan that dated back to 2012. And in 2014, they put out a butterfly conservation action plan, uh, which is not pollinator oriented as the words say, but it highlights the pollination services of butterflies. So you know, you all know as environmentalists, Without pollinators, humans and all terrestrial life on earth would cease to exist. Uh, who can identify this pollinator? This is a mechanized uh, pollinator. Exactly. Thank you, Mina, for saying that. It is a robotic bee. And so there are research facilities like Harvard, that are in the process of developing uh, mechanized pollination. Um, I know that this is already happening in Japan, Australia. I know China has hand pollinated their apple orchards for, for years. Uh, but because of pollinator decline, we, we certainly don't want to see this, do we? But because pollinator decline, Operation Pollination was conceived and is being implemented in places around the world. And there you can see the other places around the world, England, Scotland, and Mexico right now. There are clubs there that have signed a pollinator pledge, which I'll show you how to do that if you're interested. And I, I just want to let you know, it would be thrilling to have a club or a district from India sign on to Operation Pollination. So I could promote you too, as I speak to the clubs. So what is Operation Pollination? It is not a prescription. It does not tell you what to do. What you do is up to you. 
you know, whether you plant a few seeds, you know, whether you restore a bamboo forest, wh whatever, whatever you're going to do, whether you educate kids about pollinators, that's up to you. Operation Pollination is simply a framework that allows you to recruit organizational partners who want to do two things, restore habitat and educate about pollinators. Again, it's a framework. Now, I mentioned to you, I'm speaking to you from the state of Minnesota in the north central part of the United States, not far from our Great Lakes. Um, and that's me in the center of the photo in the, in the dark jackets, standing next to that guy in the white shirt. Um, back in 2015, that, that is, we, we invited other government organizations who wanted to do good things for pollinators. We invited other government land management agencies to join the National Park Service. So here in this photo, we have the US Fish and Wildlife Service, we have the US Forest Service, and the US National Park Service, all land management agencies. And so we got together and we said, you know what? Our missions are different. We have separate and distinct missions, but we do have some things in common, like climate change, water quality, endangered species, habitat restoration. You know, those are things we have in common. Pollinators, we all have those in common. So let's work together to make the world a better place. And so we joined forces and we said, okay, pollinators is what we're gonna tackle first. And so we invited other organizations to join our cause. And I'll show a picture of that in a minute. In 2020, SRAG North American Central Chapter in the midst of the pandemic really came to the rescue of Operation Pollination. I was, I was worried that Operation Pollination was going to, to go away because the pandemic really, as you know, affected people doing things for the environment. But SRAG sent North American Central adopted Operation Pollination, immediately developed a website for Operation Pollination and said it was a collaborative rotary project. And in the magazine, in Rotary Magazine in the United States, they were able to get a full spread article about Operation Pollination in the October 2020 issue. And if you were interested in looking that up, all you'd have to go to is to Rotary Magazine, October 2020, the butterfly effect, and it will, it will come up. It's the, the article was called the butterfly effect. So here are the nuts and bolts of Operation Pollination. You're probably saying, Chris, what is this? What is Operation Pollination? It's this simple, this simple. And it's meant to be simple, by the way. It's meant to be simple to engage people because we have found that simple is good. People like simple. Uh, so number one, there's the issuance of a pollinator resolution. And you know that a resolution is the weakest form of anything. This is not enforceable. There's no government oversight or anything. A simple resolution. I mean, we could make a resolution right now that every month I'm gonna, or however, I'm gonna join your SRAG meeting when you, when you have a meeting. That could be our resolution. It's a simple resolution. Then after the resolution is signed, you sign a pledge form. And this is the action part. This is where you commit to do something to help pollinators. And then you put the names of your resolute, your pledge signers on the back of your resolution. And that's it. That's really what Operation Pollination is. So step one, your club or district, you're invited to sign a simple one page resolution. By the way, there's a template for this resolution on the operationpollination.net website. And you, you are to modify that for your local condition. You know, you don't have monarchs in India, you know, so you, you or the other South Asian countries. So you'd obviously wouldn't reference the monarch. You, you, you make it specific to your local condition. Then you develop a pledge form. And this is, this is just a, an example of a simple pledge form. Your club or your district signs this pledge form where you basically commit to do something to help pollinators. And then 
your club and district recruit other organizations in your communities who might want to do something to help pollinators. These or other organizations can be large or small, government or non-government, for-profit or not-for-profit. And every contribution is valued and welcome. There is no judgment in Operation Pollination. This is an inclusive project with no judgment. Everything is valuable. And then you put the names of your pledge signers on the back of your resolution. It's that simple. A pollinator resolution, a pollinator pledge, which can be, can be issued by your district or your club, a pollinator pledge form, which can be signed by your club and other organizations that you, rec that you recruit, that's your job. And then you put the names of them on the back of your resolution. So SRAG North American Central Chapter adopted this project in August, 2020. And now, as I showed you from the beginning, those three past district governors and myself were trying to recruit clubs and districts around the world to get involved in Operation Pollination. This is new, by the way. It's relatively new where Rotary's involvement, only a year. We already have eight districts who are signed on board. And you know that each district has about 1,500 to 3,000 members in it. And so potentially this is getting those members engaged in pollinator activities. Rotary District 6450 was the first district to sign an Operation Pollination Resolution. And I bring to your attention this district because this is the, the birthplace of Rotary International. This is the district in Chicago, Illinois, which is in the central part of the United States along the, the shores of Lake Michigan, one of the Great Lakes in the United States. This was the district that Paul Harris is from. And I know you've all heard of Paul Harris. Today, in addition to 6450, we have districts and clubs in other parts of the United States and now the world who are signing pollinator resolutions. The Lute Rotary Club of Luton Summaries, England, this, that's about uh, a dozen miles north of London. They were the first international club to sign a pollinator resolution, thanks to their president, Mohammed, there on the right. And then the bottom left, that's the Rotary Club of Morelia, Mexico. That is a club that's actually near the Monarch Biosphere Reserve in Mexico. And they were the first club in Latin America to sign a pollinator resolution. They, by the way, have told me, she is not in the photograph, but the, the, the person from the Morelia Club that has been instrumental in this, her name is Eli Arias. She just sent me a message that they have 20 acres that they want to restore to pollinator habitat. Uh, and they're looking for seed. So one of the things that I've done is helped connect them with some people in Mexico who might be able to help them. That's, that's part of my job with Operation Pollination to make those connections. I find out a lot of interesting things in the process because you know, like, like those people, I'm doing this research for the first time as well. But as we wrap up here, I just want to say and, and say it again, that your district and your club is now invited to become part of this seventh area of focus project. If you want to become involved in Operation Pollination, the framework, please just contact me. And Mina has my email address. A reminder, it's this simple, a resolution, a pledge form, names on the back of the resolution. I also know that Rotarians like to get media attention. I don't know if that's the same in India and the other countries of South Asia. Is that the same? Where you yes. like media? Yes. And this, this will get you media attention, especially if you recruit other organizations, you know, in your community, because it shows the power of Rotary as networkers and forming, you know, collaborations of people. Um, so that's, that's the beauty of this. So I'll end with a few photos here from North America. This is, this is a community near, near where I, I grew up uh, on Long Island in the state of New York on the East Coast. This community out on Eastern Long Island, New York, 
maybe you could tell my New York accent. I've tried to get rid of it over the years, but it's still it's still there. Um, they planted milkweed in their community. That's that's the plant that is essential for monarchs. And so they planted milkweed. And as much as operation pollination is for organizations to get involved, I tell Rotarians in the United States and other places that never forget the power of the one. You know, if you have access to a, a bit of land where you can do something positive for pollinators, whether your Rotary Club or Rotary District ever gets involved, Never forget the power of what you can do as an individual. So I just want to thank the South Asia chapter of SRAG for inviting me to speak with you tonight. Mina, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. The, this is the end goal. The end goal is national security for pollinators. Um, you know, in the United States, we have an organization called Homeland Security. And I haven't spoken to Homeland Security about the importance of pollinators yet. But I, I, I'm going to, when, when COVID is, is uh, no worries and I'm able to travel back to Washington, D.C., where they're located, like many other federal organizations in the United States, I'm going to go speak to Homeland Security and tell them they should be worried about this as well. So I'll end with this quote. The end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And that's really what Operation Pollination is all about, knowing your place for the first time and how important it is to global pollinator health. So thank you very much again for inviting me. And now I'd like to open it up to questions if any of you have questions. Thank you again, Mina, and all of you. You're most welcome, Chris. It was a lovely talk. Thank I you. think just among the audience today, you're going to get a number of clubs ready to sign the pledge. All right. <laughs> that, that is so wonderful. That is wonderful. Just let me know how I can help. Yeah, um, I think we have a question from uh, Rotarian Sivabal. Uh, Sivabal, sir, can you unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. That is a fantastic presentation, Chris. Uh, being an agriculture graduate and did my master's in Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, one of the oldest universities in, uh, in this part of the country, especially India. And uh, we study entomology, uh, nearly seven, eight papers. Uh, we talk only about pets, moths, killing those insects with insecticides. That is the main purpose of that study. And they came out of that and uh, with insecticide, pesticides, herbicides, spoiled the entire green revolution in this part of the country. India, and uh, we, we had to feed the 140 million people here. And uh, that took a major portion and killed most of the insects uh, and uh, most of reptiles, uh, birds, everything, like not because of the, this kind of uh, revolutionized uh, chemical sales, especially the major portions of from your country only by uh, companies like Bayer, all those stuff. And uh, I came out of that and being a farmer myself and uh, I being tried to be an organic from my thesis in agriculture. I did my uh, thesis in rice cultivation without any pesticides, but the fertilizers, I could able to thrive that with uh, nitrogen uh, can be sourced from uh, organic sources rather than going for a urea. And uh, being a lot of friends of mine in still in, in the post of um, agriculture scientists in entomology, especially my friend Chitra is in Hyderabad. She is a passionate insect lover. What my question is one, what is that like? You know, this our part of this part of especially 3203 is a hard code agriculture built where we grow cash crops, annual crops, and seasonal crops, but spraying pesticides. What kind of the impact that has on this kind of insect? If I go for a pollinator garden, everything is a pest for that crop. And every moth, every moth is in a, a larvae is a uh, eating uh, cost with uh, crop eating uh, moth. I mean, uh, 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 larvae, and how can I make a, 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 a good one, a good uh, like a species of a moth or a butterfly, or a, uh, or to make it as a uh, to grow that as a pollinator? Of course, bees are one very good one. We also know bass. Of course, we don't have that kind of a volume of bass. You put us this kind of an agriculture uh, centric or massive green revolution kind of a belt. What you suggest to take a rotary forward uh, by making pollinator gardens uh, other than bees. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure if I understand the exact question. 
Uh, my I'm question going is, to... I put it straight, uh, in an agriculture belt, it is not yes. a forest kind of a thing. It is a typical hardcore agriculture belt where we live huge population. You are in Texas sitting in two square kilometers a year. Uh, that kind of a population we have. But the city I'm living in has 5 lakh population. My district has more than 35 lakh population, uh, which grows um, a huge uh, cash crops like no paddy, uh, uh, turmeric, uh, all the stuff, uh, cassava, all the stuff. Because they spray pesticides like fertilizers because they want to save the crops on the insects. That's going to be the math or a butterfly in future. But going a pollinator garden nearby with butterflies like no tiger or something like that, like no whatever, it may be a, a larva, the, the larvae may be a pest. What kind of a suggestion you suggest or what kind of, oh, I don't know about the species, and because I'm totally away from my for the last 20 years, but uh, uh, what kind of a solution you make in agriculture bed to form a uh, friendly, farmer friendly pollinator garden rather yes and uh, i should have i should have qualified um my introduction uh if you see my title it says park ranger it does not say entomologist um, <laughs> I got it. so so so, <laughs> so you know i don't know your local situation there in india i couldn't even answer that question for the united Fine. states Okay. Uh, but it's a it's a great question. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, I mean, this is this. I actually see you know humans, humankind's use of pesticides as part of evolution. You know, there are some people, some areas that are more advanced and realizing that these harmful pesticides may not be the solution. The solution. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm thinking back to my Utah State University days, uh, Mina, where Mina and I both went to school together, not, not the, uh, at the same time, but we both have the same, we both have the same, uh, yeah, I would never imply that you were as old as me, Mina. Um, we, 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 we both went to Utah State University, different fields of study, of course. I, I became a park ranger, um, but, I'm thinking about my biology lessons and, you know, you know, do, are there natural predators in India that uh, can help reduce these, these crop, these crop, yes. uh, harmful crop pests. Uh, and I'm not saying bring in a, a creature from some other place in the world, like we've done all over the world. And you may have done that in India too, because we all know that that generally leads to another disaster. Yes. Uh, but yes. But that, you know, that is a solution. Uh, you know, the, I mean, with a small pollinator garden, if you were trying to uh, grow that in an agricultural area for its education, for its value, I think the value might be the educational value. Uh, you could, you know, if you did have uh, the ability to do that, you could try to remove, if you know what the, uh, the harmful pests look like in their um, their egg stage or their larval stage or their pupa stage. If you if you know what they look, you could try to remove them. Okay. So your pollinator garden is not harboring the insects that are going to cause a problem in these agricultural areas. Yeah. Again, I'm not an entomologist, but these are just some of the things that I I could think of. Okay. Um, and in an area like yours uh, that you talk about intensive agriculture with all that spraying and everything, I think the real initial value of a pollinator garden would be its educational value. As I, I mentioned that Operation Pollination has two goals. Yes. You know, one, one and, the, and the foremost goal is habitat restoration. Okay. But a, 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 an equally important goal is the educational value of, of uh, informing people about the importance of pollinators. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for uh, a, a very, I think, uh, practical uh, answer to uh, Rotarian Sivubal's question. Uh, we now have uh, Rotarian Chandrasekhara from uh, Sunrise, RC Sunrise. Uh, sir, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Good morning, Krish, and good evening to all others. My question is, uh, Krish, you are telling that pollinators have come down by about 40%. Yes. 
what might be the reason and is it uniform all over the world or is it peculiar only to the american continent and second question is how does the forest fires in california has, how much it has affected the pollinators whether that has contributed heavily for the reduction in the pollinator numbers thank you those are outstanding questions um so the 40 percent number is from scientific papers um, that have been con that have been uh, written and researched, and um, I I do not think it is uniform across the globe. But I did I did re uh, the what I have read um, from these papers is that this decline is a global phenomenon. It is it, you know it may not it could be higher in some places. It could be lower in some places, but 40% is the average decline. Regarding the fires, fires in California, have you spoken to my wife, by the way? Because she's she's telling me, you know, those forest fires in California, they're decimating the monarch population. I mentioned to you in the program that there are two populations of monarch. There is a Western population and an Eastern population. And the Rocky Mountains, which run down the, the or spine down the central part of the United States or western central western part of the United States, they separate the eastern population from the western population. And the western population, the counts this past year, put the monarch, the western population, at 2,000 individuals. That, that, that subspecies, in my opinion, is about to blink out. Uh, you know, there's no way. That's that subspecies can be brought back. I, I don't think. Um, you know, the eastern population, there's still millions, but of the western population, two thousand. And if and if we don't think that those forest fires are affecting them, uh, we're absolutely wrong. Because those those that western population of monarch does not go to the mountains in Mexico. By the way, it goes to the coast of California to spend the winter. If there you, are some that's so you, yes that those fires are affecting the population undoubtedly but i think there is probably research that is going on right now that has yet to be published a few years back we had a chance of looking at the monarch butterflies in the western really coast. yeah we are were, you telling me that you went to see them yeah we could see them you went to mexico not to mexico in the California only in some coastal area we went and we saw we, saw, we could see the monarch butterflies. We well, those those roosts, yeah. they have been decimated. It's I am very sad to say. And in some of those roosts, they're no longer in existence. Again, it is very unfortunate. The, po the population is 2,000. There's no way of getting back. No. Yeah, um, I don't I, think so. I yeah. don't think so. It makes my heart cry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Me, uh, mine too. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rotarian Rajalakshmi, uh, you have raised your hand. Would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, sir. thank you so much. Uh, Chris, actually, uh, being an educator and academician, I just would like to take this uh, uh, drive or this uh, resolution to the students. Uh, so first thing is, first question is, uh, how simple can we just make this so that we can reach the students? Uh, second is, what is the land required? Because everyone will not be having acres of lands. Maybe they will have a, a, a portico or some uh, smaller area. Can we just have uh, that part for this pollination uh, things? Yes, yes, that, that is a great question. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Operation Pollination is a very inclusive project and every contribution is valued. You know, whether it's one plant or in the United States, we have prairies, you know, you're restoring a prairie, whatever you can do is valuable. So yes, if you have a portico and you, have, you can put some pollinator plants out there, that is good. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've spoken to a number of Rotary Clubs in the United States this year about this project. And when I speak to the Rotary Clubs in Chicago area, many of those people do not have lots of land. 
Many of them live in apartment buildings and they have a balcony. And they ask me the same question, can I plant a few plants on my balcony? And the answer is yes. You know, I don't, I don't know, again, I'm not an entomologist, so I can't tell you how high the pollinators fly. Um, so that, that is an issue that you would have to research. Um, you know, I've gotten various answers. You know, some pollinators fly several hundred feet up. Um, so a, a, a plant up on a balcony several hundred feet up is, is valuable. Um, but your Indian situation, I don't, I don't know. So you'd have to research that. But absolutely, Portico is, is good. Now, with your students, you know, I hope I've gotten across to you during today's presentation that the one thing that Operation Pollination is, is simple. It does not have to be complex. Um, you know, the value of just signing a resolution and that basically says that you understand the problem. That's what a resolution is. We understand the problem. Then if they want to do something like plant plants on, on their portico, they sign a pledge form and they say, this is what we're going to do. Again, it's, it's so important. You know, I, I, have to, I have to chuckle at Operation Pollination because it's so simple, it's complex. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be complex. It can be very simple, like I mentioned to you, just planting a few pollinator plant seeds. It could be that simple. Uh, you don't have to, you don't, some clubs I speak to, they want to do extravagant things. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't have to do that. You know, you don't have to do that. Yes, if you want to do an extravagant thing, if you want to do like that Mexican club wants to do, they say hey, they have 20 acres that they have access to. That's great. That's great. But if you don't have that type of land, and most people don't, um, anything is valuable. I don't know if that answered your question, but but certainly, and, and by the way, if you want me to come speak to your students, thanks to Zoom, we can do that now. That's lovely. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. I hope uh, you have answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, okay, and I, uh, Abzil, uh, I think you have an observation to make. Please unmute yourself, sir, and uh, um, you can speak. Hello. Good morning, Christopher, and good evening, everybody. Now, regarding the, uh, the plot of land, see, we had converted one dumping ground, age-old dumping ground, one and a half acre into a biodiversity park. And when we started the work over there, there was only one butterfly, one species of butterfly. And within about uh, four years, we wow. got over there uh, 37 species of butterflies. Wow. And, many, and within a span of four years, and uh, many insects were uh, seen over there, and they're all noted down. So the place is not that very important. Okay, if I had, don't have a much bigger place, okay, you can do it wherever you have it, and it can be done. And it is not a difficult task at all. It can be done. Now, oh, forget that part, uh, one and a half acre. In our balcony where I stay, balcony, we have planted about uh, different varieties of plants. And here it's a, it has become a breeding ground for butterflies in the balcony. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, th those so, are wonderful. Those are wonderful stories. And they, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you mentioned those. Thank you. That's exactly okay. what I'm trying to say, but I didn't say it as effectively as you did by real life stuff. That's right. uh, Chris, uh, uh, Rotarian Khatri and his wife have been recognized by the government of India for their outstanding work. Um, you know, there's a Google page. You can just Google his name and see and you can see in Mumbai what the kind of work that they have done there. Congratulations, sir. Very good. Very Yes. Happy, yes. Proud of you. And Congratulations. We are the very pioneer people in uh, working for the electronic waste in uh, India, Bombay. Any other questions uh, from anyone else? Okay. Uh, uh, one information to share. The, there is a refinery in Assam called as Lumaligarh Refinery, and they have set up a park for butterflies in roughly about three acres of the land. It's a beautiful place to visit if somebody can. It's interested to visit. They have been doing it for the last 20 years now. 
Okay. Okay. Thanks, uh, Rotiran uh, Ajay, for that uh, information. There's one final question from uh, Rotiran Rajal Lakshmi, who asks, uh, what are the kinds of plants that we need to plant uh, to attract uh, the uh, butterflies um, into to it? I'm, I'm going to chuckle and, uh, and, and I'm going to point to my photo and tell you once again that there is not the word botanist in front of my name. Uh, so in the United States, I would have an answer for you though. Uh, in India, I think you need to speak to your locals, you know, botanists and entomologists. And you all know that insects tend to be very species specific, okay? Uh, and so, you know, don't bring in exotic plants from, you know, Africa or you know, North America or South, you know, plant native plants. I will tell you that. And, you know, you have experts in India, I'm sure, that can tell you what plants attract what insects. In the United States, and I'm sorry, I can't answer you more than that for India, uh, but in the United States, I will tell you that there are some NGOs that have some pretty nifty websites. You can actually, in the United States, you can actually type in your zip code of where you live on some of these NGO sites and up will pop the native plants that you should plant in your zip code. I don't think, I don't know for sure, I don't think you have that in India, but if, if you do and anybody on this Zoom knows, please mention it now. Uh, especially for butterflies, we have state lists and area specific lists that you can go for. And uh, there are a lot of uh, citizen science groups that will let you know what to plant and where to plant. Uh, we, uh, from Hanuman's side, we have got a wonderful, uh, the, FRLHT Foundation for this thing. They have a beautiful native nursery, garden uh, nursery. And there are places that will give you the list of things to plant and how many to plant, depending on your area. And you can do that. There are also consultancies which will come bring the plants to you and design it for you. So it is that there, there are enough and more people who do it. Thank you, Mina, for that good Thank information. You. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to be too cute by saying I'm not an entomologist or botanist, but I'm not. Uh, you know, we all, we all have our specialties and, and there's more entomologists and botanists on this call uh, than, than I am. I'm just, I'm just showing you a way where you can engage folks in, in the importance of habitat restoration and education. So please forgive me for not knowing the answers to some questions. Hanuman, do you have your little presentation on your garden? Yeah, uh, uh, we just, yeah, I have it with me. If you could uh, make me a uh, host, yeah, um, I'll just share mine. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, for having me speak with you today. Oh, you're most welcome. It was a very interesting. A, hi a, highlight, a highlight of my year, I will say. <laughs> Okay, so um, the, here was this thing uh, that we did it, uh, you know, uh, this is what it is now. And I'll, this is the original one where we, where we had uh, a school, you know, which came forward and uh, gave a little bit of land for us to do a pollinator park. They were very keen. Uh, so they gave us some land and, and we went from our club and, uh, we, we cleared the entire area of what was there earlier and then we had a, a, a beautiful organization and a partner organization like how Chris advocates. They came in and they supplied the, the, the propagules and we planted them along with the help of, from local help. And after six months, I mean, I'm delighted to say that uh, six months down the line, uh, we have a beautiful, you know, it has started flowering and, and uh, you can see that it has come up very well. And the people there, the caretaker there are, are, are very happy and they want us to replicate the same thing in another part of, of their school. So it is just goes to show that, and being a school, the education part of it, like again, like how Chris emphasized, that is going on very well. 
so it, it is really you know uh, 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 an opportunity for so many rotary clubs we could adopt small parks inside the city where we can manage you know not big ones very small ones even say 1000 square feet and we can plant these things and see them grow in front of our eyes and have the local school children come in and we can have a two in one kind of thing you know going on there just as how uh, you know chris was talking about earlier so uh, we hope to do many more you know parks uh, this time round and uh, uh, i think this is a very good project because the the budget is not much so many uh, clubs can take up small islands of uh, of of uh, make it uh, you know pollinator parks in their own communities that that if mina if i could just say a few words on that thank you for sharing that and you're already doing something so you are already part of operation pollination all you have to do is sign a resolution and say you recognize it and then you sign a pledge form and say say what you did you're already a part so i put my i put my i put my email address in the chat please any of you on this call contact me and i can send you templates i can help you uh if you need help um but that was wonderful and it and if you wouldn't mind sending me those slides or, you know just to show i would love to to brag about you and what you're doing it, it was meenakshi it was rotarian meenakshi's inspiration it was she who pointed out and was went behind us to get it done so we are outstanding that, oh, i would love to brag about you yeah is there in this newsletter the strike newsletter that came out yesterday they've done a feature on hanuman outstanding i will look that up Mm -hmm. uh the, if you could uh, uh can i use the templates that you sent to me in the email and i can put it out for the people here to uh do yes it? yes uh, yes uh, so let's do that and you'll have more international partners <laughs> outstanding outstanding that that I would be uh one point here is that in india we just have about six bee species which are hive you know bees that make the hives the rest are all solitary bees and we never talk about it and you know yes. most uh this thing actually bumblebees are not found in the peninsula this thing they only found in himalayas but we have carpenter bees throughout the rest of the country and they are great you know they they carry more pollen than anything else and uh what i would like to uh, say and talk to these rotary clubs is you know make just basic you know cutouts of the kind of insects that you get and you know you could also with the kids involvement look at the number of pollinators that come in a day you know the butterflies may be there for some small time but it's the flies the silfid flies are all over the place <laughs> in the in in north america we also have a the that bee situation where you know we everybody talks about the the european honey bee which was imported you know hundreds of years ago to help our agricultural crops and it is essential for our agricultural production but we have about 3000 native bee species that are solitary nesters that nobody talks about and just one more point what shibbal was talking about uh when we started working with farmers who had just caught raker and things like that we started doing uh, uh like a multi crop on the edges with fodder and with flowers so those became the places where you would get your lace wing you would get your uh ladybird beetles and things like that and that really helped and especially by growing the forage the forage trees a little higher around the uh acreage it reduced the amount of you know cross uh, pollination uh, so to speak of the pesticides so that's another thing to look at and if you have different structures in your farm in terms of uh, you know low lying herbs to higher this thing you really can help uh, reducing a lot of the pesticide use yeah so yeah mean i see uh uh we have now moved towards um, um, organic or uh, pest eating kind of a, uh, other insects or wasps we are coming but it's not fully effective now and farmers are readily taking it out because it's it, it's the time exactly, consuming 
three to four years for the whole structure to come up. You yeah, see? exactly. And uh, what we can do is, I just uh, going to invite uh, Chitra entomologist from Hyderabad sure. to that. And uh, we'll uh, the same team, our South Asia team can have. I will bring, I will give her a homework to study on the whole thing and suggest her to select this species, uh, especially the butterflies, which species, which which eats what, and which can be grown as a garden. And so that it, it is mm -hmm. uh, very farmer friendly and as well as eco friendly, so that like we can develop that kind of a small uh, pilot project that can be copied across this part of the uh, state, maybe yeah. in Karnataka. Uh, Tamana. You should invite Purni Jairam also, who was with the National uh, Bio Biological mm -hmm. Festival. Yeah, exactly. We should have a, a discussion so we there. Have that. What I think is we should have like a little seminar, you know. Exactly. And that would work more than a Zoom this thing, you know, on site in some farm and they. Can we can help. do that. We can do that. Because that would uh, reach out um, to more people. Rajalakshmi, your uh, turn up. Yeah, I have one. Talk. I think we lost her. We lost her. Uh -huh. So basically, uh, this is how we work with very small farmers, Shubal. These are all quarter acre sort of things, okay? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Though they were going down in the amount of uh, area that they were growing the plants, I um, mean okay. the vegetables, it okay. helped. Uh, okay. I, in my experience, for the three years that I worked with those farmers in Hosu, anyone who's got less than a half acre uh, plot was willing to try. It was the larger farmers who didn't want yeah, to do yeah. anything. They want to do uh, commercialize the farming. They use only the chemicals. Exactly. To so, and uh, they are just not ready for it. And why can't we shift to paddy, which is, you know, the native varieties, which actually do not need that much water either. But yeah, again, you only... Exactly. Uh, uh, only five centimeters of water is more than... But people are storing more than 20 it, centimeters of water. Exactly. Exactly. Wasting the whole water, yes. Right. Come on, Shivbal. We'll take our district in a different direction. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that. <laughs> All right. We'll do, uh, that. Yeah. do we have any more questions for Chris? I think we should have uh, Chris come back in another three, four months and we'll yes. see how many of these pollinator parks are in evidence. And that would be a nice little seminar yes. to have. Yes, yes. yes. Well, I, I am, I, again, I am at your service anytime you want me. And there are 35,000 Rotary Clubs in the world. I'm willing to speak to every single one if that's what it takes to help pollinators. And so if any of you on this evening's uh, Zoom uh, would like me to come to your individual club to speak, please just let me know. I put my email in the chat. Uh, any of you can contact me at any time. Uh, as I said in the introduction, or as was said in the introduction, it's only taken me four decades to realize that the most important thing for us to do is to protect what we have in our own community. Uh, yes, I've worked at great national parks around the country and even the world, but really taking care of your own home is, is, is essential for the future of this planet. Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful you know, parting thoughts, Chris. Uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing, seeing you again as Meenakshi rightly pointed out. I think three, four months from now, we should have a review a session on uh, you know uh, how things are what, what, yeah and i'm going to plaster your pollination pl plan as a little powerpoint that i'll send it out to the clubs that i can and let's well, see how we can go forward yeah uh, with it chris well that would be wonderful and and uh, you know i would love to add india to england scotland and mexico i'd love to add india to to that you as well Hanuman's Herbal Garden, you already yeah. have is one. And I've got I'll, one here in the degrees. In so the, in the yes. Yes. yes, yes. Outstanding. So Hanumath, if you could just sign a resolution yeah. with your club and a pledge form yes. and let me and let just let me know it's done. Once you let me know it's done. Oh, and by the way, take a photo. Take a photo of your your president or whoever signing, and I'll put it in the slides. Even Minakshi in Sangli, we have our club has uh, formed one butterfly park. You know? So oh, that also, I will I will share that uh, last year we have done, and I will share the last year peak as well as this year how much the growth and everything is there. You know, last nice, year, nice. Even Chris, you already got 
Shakya on the map. Even two Rotarians in our club, they are very much passionate about the butterfly. And uh, I, in future, really, I will uh, in contact with Minakshi. I will uh, call you, Chris, for the as a speaker for our club also. Because in Sanskrit, there are so many people are passionate about the uh, this butterfly in uh, garden. The more Rotarians are are 1.2 million Rotarians around the world. Can you imagine if every Rotarian did just a little bit to help pollinators? Every day, only for watching the butterfly, they are going for different <laughs> places. Well, thank you again. All right. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Chris. Uh, this is uh, Rotarian Sanjeev Kadam here. Yes, indeed. And uh, that, that was a great presentation. And uh, Chris, you can count me in. Uh, we will be inviting you as a speaker for either the district or, you know, uh, multi-club presentation. Well, it's a, Thank it's you. A great question. We're going to chase this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Sanjeev. Sanjeev. Thank you, Sanjeev. Okay. Uh, should we close the meeting, uh, I, Hanuman? Yeah, it's, it's, I think, well past the hour. So, yeah. Um, we, we should probably wind up now at least this session and hoping for many more from you, Chris. And thank you all for a, for a very patient listening, for a very interactive session. And thanks, Chris, once again for being here with us. Thank you, Meenakshi, for organizing this whole thing. Abzarji, thank you, Meena. Shivabal, thank everyone. You. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. So I think we will have the battle of the state, battle of the districts who gets the most number of pollinator parks. Don't worry. We'll throw it as a challenge. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Chris Bye -bye. has to go to Bye -bye. see her da yeah, daughter's playing football. He has to leave for that. No, mm. <laughs> his, his daughters might be waiting for her to come to the football ground. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Meena. So, no, it, it, uh, it was just a nice way in, in the sense that he had contacted us through the chapters and I said, Come on, let's just do a call. And uh, I'm very happy to see so many of us. And a lot of us have already started the process. I think let's just, you know, it doesn't take a lot to do any of these pollinator gardens, and they're more fun to do it too, you know. And uh, as the, uh, other, uh, as, yes, like after, we are just, uh, I think we are looking only at butterflies. The pollinators, pollinators, there are seven, no, no, seven, seven, eight. Uh, oh, I'm just thinking out of the whole thing. Like, no, the farmers are. Uh, very happy if they put beehives, okay? They will get income also. Once mm -hmm. the pollination is done, they will not spray any chemicals. It is organic and uh, honeybees will okay. give them income mm -hmm. also. And uh, of course, that can be uh, spread because there are a lot of farms here have a lot of beehives. Maybe we have to educate them to do yeah. that. And that is also a kind of thing we can adopt. And giving beehives to the uh, under, I mean, uh, under, 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 under economically a very, very low level kind of uh, families with just a couple of cows and uh, goat. And uh, this also uh, supplies other, uh, satisfy other vertical of the um, rotary is the economic uh, sustainability of the poor men. So the tribes also we can do that. Like you know, in tribes areas, like you no, know, we can make sure. Like the particular, I have tested one Nagapuram. At that time, I, I used to travel to Karur uh, and that day Kodumbri. There is a small beehive farm. They sell uh, typically uh, pure pure honey. Mm -hmm. And at that time of flowering, I'll get black honey. That is totally Nagapuram. And sometimes we'll get orange kind of honey. Very, very tasty. Uh, very good, like, you know, for the health also. So let us make a kind of a thing which spreads across pollination. And butterflies, of course, as he said, uh, as Nagyo no, no, said, it's part of <laughs> beautification. My idea of calling it as a butterfly park is like calling, you know, everything is yeah. a tiger reserve. It yes. is just that. Uh, okay, I'm okay. sorry, uh, butterflies are not my favorite thing. So... <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I am no, all uh, entire what, a larvae. If I say a larvae, it is a pest to me. Yeah, <laughs> Any exactly. larvae, that's, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I cannot. And then putting these lights in the night, you know, <laughs> attracting more moths to come and lay eggs in the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Moth, see, I have read more than 500 insects in my life in college days. Like, you know, everything uh, is a moth, and some uh, are butterflies. And most of the things are moth. We roam around the university at 2 a.m. or 3 o'clock in the morning yeah, yeah. to get adults. <laughs> to so I just going back old days, I just imagine how many moths packets are uh, hanging in, in, uh, above my head on the bed. Like, you know, we used to wrap that. <laughs> I used to do, do that. Like, put, we'll, in the evening, we'll go around, pick up the leaves of the each, each piece uh, which eats what, and put them in the packet, wrap it for 20, 30 days. And then get the adult, then get that killed with cyanide, put that in the insect box. 
Seriously, yeah, that gives me mad. I know, I'm, I know, I see, I'm not an entomologist, but I got into working with insects. Yo, the first yo, yo. ones that I were working with was a diamondback moth. Yeah, diamondback with, was a uh, good You know, with the uh, this thing. Yeah. Uh, so getting them uh, this thing. Here I find more than even uh, the crucifer is this thing. I also grow flax. Okay. So it works as a way of, you know, uh, getting the flax from my, this thing. And that really kind of buffers a lot of my vegetables too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So but we'll get Chitra and we'll get Purni to come and talk. Yeah, uh, I'll talk to her uh, tomorrow morning and uh, get that fixed. We'll have a con call. Uh, then after that, yeah. like, you know, we can listen on that. And uh, uh, Gunatali Garaj is also very pre -open. Gunatali Garaj is my, oh, yeah, he's my professor, yes. Yeah, yeah, he's... Uh, he, uh, he is free also most of the days, so we can just drag him in also. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Good thank night, you, thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you very bye. much. Thank you very bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.